So, we have discussed uh, about auxiliary electron spectroscopy in the last class and uh, this is the continuation of the, that lecture and I have basically talked about the basic principles of auxiliary spectroscopy, the applications where it can be used and I have given you some basic equations and diagrams to explain how the auxiliary electrons are generated. Now, in the subsequent lecture of, as of today, we are going to see different applications of RJ electron spectroscopy and finally, I am going to show you the actual machine or actually configuration of a machine in the RJ spectroscopy. So, uh, before that let me just reiterate the following thing which I was, I should do it very carefully. The reason RJ is very famous and very useful technique is because the signals which we get from the samples are basically from a very small thickness, very very small thickness of the surface. This is what is shown here. If you look at the sample surface and then there are different kinds of signals which are generated because of the inherent excitement or excited uh, excitation by the primary electrons as the primary electron falls on the samples it causes lot of excitation and that leads to different kinds of signals. Signals can be backscatter electrons, signals can be secondary electrons or it even a characteristic x-rays which are used in the scanning electron microscopes and also we will have auxiliary electrons. But if you look at the interaction volumes from which the signals generate or get generated is varies from very large thickness to a very small thickness depending on the type of signal. So, for the characteristic x-rays the interaction volume actually is very large. The depth from which the information can be can come is of the order of 3 less than 3 micron 1 to 3 micron actually. On the other hand the backscatter electron comes about you see here backscatter electron comes about uh, approximately about 2 micron, secondary electrons come from about approximately about couple of hundreds of my Armstrong, uh, hundreds of actually nanometers not Armstrong. But Augier which is very significant in uh, you know radiation comes from only 4 to 50 Armstrong depth and it is only possible to get auxiliary excitation for atomic numbers higher than 3. So, we can always get excitation from electrons uh, uh, from elements which are having atomic number more than 3 that is higher than the lithium. So, that means the information which is coming from auxiliary is basically coming from a very small depth on the sample surface and that is why it is very 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 significant tool to analyze those kind of small uh, you know features on the sample surface in the Augea. So, this is what is shown here this is the electron beam you can see here and then this is the depth from which the information comes in the Augea. Depending on the spot size also and not only spot size, spot size, electron gun the spatial resolution, resolution means this way resolution spatial means this not the depth, but the x y would depend on. In the direction permanent surface analysis volume depends on the electron mean free path that is what I am shown mean, mean free path is high then electrons can generate more auxiliary it is low then so mean free path is shown here as a function of electron voltage electron energy actually. If you see here gold and this is silver they have a very small mean free path mean free path increases to you know like molybdenum, cerium, beryllium ok. So, that means or even some other elements like uh, phosphorus. So, that means the mean free path actually uh, depends on electron excitation energy is very high for the gold, silver others, but very low for the beryllium and other and, and the phosphorus and iron also. So, that, that that actually tells us that you know perpendicular depth will also vary depending on the mean free path of the electron and different elements. This also sets that what kind of elements you can analyze from a particular depth. Well, now let us move into the applications as I said we are going to discuss today that the, the 
the analysis depth was just the information I wanted to convey clearly. We have already discussed about the chemical analysis by using XPS or excess photosynthesis spectroscopy. It is one of the best complementary techniques for XPS in the chemical analysis. Depending on the kinetic energy of the Auger electrons, AES is more sensitive to surface than the XPS. Heat also gives us chemical shifts depending on the characteristics or the basically ionic state of the element present. Auger landscapes can be used to determine the chemical state of a given element in a sample and in studies the charge transfer in alloys. This is very important. One can actually study the charge transfer in alloys. Let us now look at the differences in the line shape and the peak positions for the carbon Auger spectra KVB VB stands for vacuum in different CX and HY compounds. First let us talk about it, uh, you know acetylene C2H2 that are you know triple bonds between two carbon atoms. You can clearly see there are three distinct peaks one broad and two very sharp peaks coming at around from about 240 to 260. Uh, 255 actually kV, but if you go to C2H4 that is ethylene where there is a double bond you can clearly see the peak splits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Not only that the positions of the peaks also little bit has shifted to the left side that is lower kinetic energies. Now if I go to the, element, the, the CH4 that is the methane. I can clearly see one big strong peak clearly visible and others very small peaks are visible. So that means the electron yield versus kinetic energy diagram can distinctly differentiate between carbon compounds from ethylene from acetylene to ethylene to methane. This is just basically to detect an, a an particular compound we can use these signatures to detect whether they are present in the, in the sample or not. That is the first thing you must know. So that means chemical analysis means qualitative and quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis means whether we are able to detect a particular compound or element or particular pieces on the sample surface or not. And second thing if we are able to detect many chemical pieces whether we can quantify the amount of the each of these elemental pieces or compounds present in the sample surface. This is very typical of any spectroscopy, but Auger also gives us much you know, extra information other than this only. Well, now let us talk about little bit about the uh, you know elemental shapes for the different uh, you know first transition metal series: scandium, titanium, scandium stands for 21, and then zinc stands for actually 30. So, if you go from 21 to 30. 2p 3 by 2 peaks actually shifts 399 electron volts to 1022 electron volts. 3p peaks shifts from 29 to 89. Now, if you make alloys between them, actually, suppose if you make alloys between scandium and titanium, they will be shift of 327. Similarly, between titanium and they will shift of 421. So, you can clearly see the shifts because of the formation of alloys among the different elements. This alloys means solid solution types. Well, not only that one can actually look at the chemical shifts in terms of atomic number versus electron energy diagram. This one I have already shown to you. Now, now if you if you carefully look at this diagram, it says different transitions like KLL transition, LMM transition, MNN transitions and higher depend on the atomic number. So, obviously, if the atomic number is less than about say 16 that is for sulphur you will not have any uh, you will have only KAL transitions. Only when atomic numbers of the elements higher than 16 and lower than about 45 you have basically LMM transitions. L and, 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 and there is a small overlap obviously between uh, LMM and the KAL transitions. Similarly, there is a small overlap between MMM MNN and LMM transitions also, but MNN transitions actually occurs mostly for the elements with a very high atomic number like more than 45 and less than about 84, 83. So, that means uh, depending on this 
from this from this diagram actually one can actually understand that if I have alloys suppose if I have alloys between aluminum and the uh, niobium obviously there will be chemical shift of the peaks from both aluminum and niobium because of these different transitions. Not only that there will be also chemical shift if you consider only suppose elements which are very close by suppose if you consider boron and uh, you know aluminum. So, there will be some chemical shift possible even in KLL transition because of the atomic configuration, electron configuration change or charge, trans charge transfer issues in the alloys. To give you much better perspective how the chemical shift actually is observed in the uh, OGR, I am not actually discussing the exact physics behind the chemical shift because this is what I have done in a XPS. The theory is same whether it is for XPS or OGR, only thing which I am describing here is that how this chemical shifts can be used to detect a particular type of chemical bonding or a particular type of you know electronic configuration. Let us consider silicon and oxidized silicon. In silicon you have silicon silicon bonds and if I take OG spectra the silicon silicon bond gives us a very characteristic peaks at about 1600 and 17 to 18 electron and volt. But when the silicon is oxidized which is most of the cases happens on the surface of the silicon you have a silicon oxygen bond. So, therefore, because of the presence of silicon oxygen bond the peak from this one gets shifted to the lower value and it has been observed the peak comes at about 1605 electron volts. So, OGS spectrum or spectra from the elemental silicon which is very pure and the oxidized silicon which is having oxygen as a one of the element present in the along the silicon can distinguish the type of bonding between these two very clearly. And it is even much clearer in OGR than in XPS that this kind of chemical shifts are actually observed and can be used to differentiate between the different kinds of bondings, bonding in the sense of whether it is a bond between similar atoms or dissimilar atoms oxidized nitrides all can be detected there. To give you much even higher no no much better perspective in the sense let us now talk about elemental germanium and germanium with a thin oxide layer same as silicon. But here the elemental germanium is a germanium single crystals. So, you have germanium 0 peak germanium 4 peak you can see this is germanium LNM transitions. On the other hand if you look at if there is oxide that is how they basically these two this is actually from the pure germanium this is from the oxidized peak. So, this is oxide this is pure germanium. So, you have oxide layer this is shipped from the pure germanium 0 and germanium 4 peaks to the um, lower level say from 1175 1175 to 11 you know 45 germanium 0 peak ships. Not only that even the OGA is very sensitive to presence of very small quantum element like semiconductor doping. Let us talk about semiconductor doping of a silicon. The difference between P and N type silicon can also be distinguishedly seen in the OGA spectra that is what is shown in this slide. So, I know you know that P and N type silicons can be created by doping different elements if you dope with you know P uh, the pop, uh, five you know bor uh, the like phosphorus with silicon you get p n type and if you do with boron you get p type or other elements like. So, uh, this is the yield in the XPS and kinetic energy plot you can see n type and p type that is a distinct you know position of the peaks and the energy difference between these two peaks are about 0 0.6 electron volts. So, that means XPS is so sensitive it can also detect this much of energy spread when you dope the silicon to make it n or p type. The small shift is sufficient enough to tell us let us know 
that it is indeed a an n type or p type. Well, one can actually uh, detect even this peak shift. This picture is not very clear. I have taken from a book, but it's not clear. But still, I want to show you because so that you can get idea. So this is basically difference between n and p type. This is n type. This is p type silicon. In the image. So we can actually take a silicon single crystal and dope elements of different types and make as n p n junction a p n junction basically here n and p. This is the junction. So you can see that peak shift changes, peak shift as a distance is basically changes continuously from n type to p type. This is basically the quantified value of the peak shift from n type region to p type region. So one can actually get an idea of continuous you know change in the in the in the doping characteristics as a function of distance by doing taking XPS spectra at different points on the sample surface like this. This is possible, this is major applications. Next thing which I would like to discuss is the quantification in XAES. I think we, I have discussed a lot about quantification in XPS. Similarly, RGS spectra can also be used to quantify different elements. So quantification analysis using first principle is possible, but normally not done due to large difference between coupling schemes that govern the object transitions in a multi ionized atom. What does it means is that if there is a multi ionized atom then there will be large differences between the couplings of different transitions and this makes the quantification difficult. The most common analysis use sensitive factors derived from the pure materials or standards. These materials also have lot of problem of precision and should be used judiciously. Because I like to know, like you to know that AES allows us to quantify different elements present on the sample surface, but precisions are much poorer than XPS. So what is the actual mathematical equation which uses sensitivity factor? Actually OJ electron density in a any position x, y, z is given by this big equation. This is the incident beam intensity, this is the cost section, this is the energy level, this is the diameter from which it is coming is also a function of energy level and the incident beam angle and these are all this is the atom in number of atoms which has undergone transitions, exponential, transition wavelengths and cost theta the scattering. This is very complex formula and I do not want to discuss in detail because that requires you know a lot of theories to be first discussed. Simplified formula for homogeneous material is that x i the amount of particular element i present is given by i s by s i divided by summation of i j by s j, but j is can be summed over. So therefore i s is basically the scattering factor and i is the intensity. So if I know the scattering factors of the elements present and if I know the intensities of the each peaks I can actually indirectly calculate what is the amount of present in the particular specimen. So let us go back to the OGS spectra. This is OGS spectra coming from oxygen, iron, nickel and obviously carbon is inevitably present or omnipresent in any sample. So a small carbon peak which is sometimes used to even calibrate. So if oxygen KLL transition here, then iron LMM transition here and nickel this is a small peak here and these two peaks basically LMM transition nickel. Now as you see here the big peaks are this one for oxygen, this one for iron and this one for nickel correct. Now I can actually calculate the area under these three peaks and get the intensity right. So and then if I know the scattering factor I can calculate or quantify each of these element presents. One, one can actually take basically differentiate this intensity with respect to energy then can much be get can get much better plot which I have discussed already about the OGS spectra. Oxygen spectra becomes like this nickel comes like that. So this way one can actually improve the quantification precision much better way. 
Well, let us now look into much detail. This is the sensitive factor with versus atomic number. Sensitive factor is what I discussed. This is a sensitivity factor as you see from this part to this part. It contains the transitions energy level, the scattering cross sections, incident beam energy level. So, sensitive factors may vary from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 depending on the atomic number and depending on the transitions for a 3 kilo, kilo volt primary electron beam this is calculated. For KLL transition sensitive factor will be very much lower and it, it basically close to 1 for most of the elements you studied. This is very important because you know KLL transition is normally seen for all the element less than atomic number less than 16 or which are lower actually than sulphur and uh, so therefore this is what we get and the sensitivity factor is low that means the quantification done from these elements by AES is even much less precise. The highest sensitivity factor is obtained for LMM transitions and LMM transition actually takes place for a large number of you know at elements starting from atomic number 16 to atomic number about 45 uh, 65. Let me just go back there and to show you what is that. So, this is yeah this is 45. So, this basically starts from 12 to 45. So, that is a large range that is and that is the range we are having a very large value. So, you can see here this is something like 12, this is what left something like 35 or 40, 40 here. So, uh, in this range from this to this actually the sensitive factor is quite high. So, therefore, our measurements will be better. MM and tangi, MNN transitions actually occurs at large atomic numbers more than 40 and about to 85 and this is also very high for a you know atomic number ranges from 38 to 62. So, that means from the all the atomic elements uh, with atomic number from about 16 to about 62 the, the sensitivity factor is quite good and actually it is higher than uh, 0.5. So, uh, that means we can actually use AGAs for these elements to get much better quantification analysis. Well, if I this also depends on the primary beam as you know if I use a 10 kilo electron primary beam this is how the curves get shifted. Well, not much shifting has happened except for the uh, you know L, we are getting an extra transition at LMM transitions. But LMM transitions actually uh, we, we are getting still extended LMM transitions you can see there. So, uh, little bit of change happens but not much. Now, uh, we can actually do it uh, this is the sensitivity factor uh, sorry. So, we can actually do it much better way uh, that by assuming the concentration to be relative ratio of atoms we can neglect the terms that depends on the instruments. So, we get this is a i sigma i I think we, there is no need of discussing we have already discussed about that, but this this is a different scheme. The important thing is you have to understand it is a semi quantitative technique it is not a quantitative technique per se like x p s. Well to determine the peak intensity I know that is what is very important because you want to calculate the area under the peak to know the in actual the intensity. So, one has to be very careful about to measure the peak intensity I am showing you some plots to make you understand how that you know judgment is very important. So, this is the kinetic energy this is the CPS as you see this is the plot of silicon the P and B is basically the peak and the background. So, you have to consider the peak area this way on the other hand if you take D any by D but this kinetic energy you get a much better peak this is your peak area correct. So, that means it is better to use d any by d than any by e versus kinetic energy plot to determine the area under the peaks. So, that quantification is much precise. Well, to give you a analysis as compared to the you know others for compounds nitrogen compounds like this chromium nitride, vanadium nitride, titanium nitride, scandium nitrides the first row tangential metal nitrides you have basically L 3 M 2 or 3 M 2 uh, peaks for this 
you can see these are the peak positions the changes and for L3 M2 MT the peak positions actually are then uh, this is what is important in as deposited condition this is how the intensity ratio varies you know to 1 B stands for you know for this once this is the severe overlap so we cannot detect B means we cannot detect that is overlap these are the ratios after iron bombardment ratio gets modified right. On the other hand if you do using RBS that is what we will discuss in the next the RBS means other for backscattering which is the same tool the secondary ion mass spectroscopy this is the data we get. So, you can see this is very close for the vanadium scandium nitride okay, but this is not this is close to vanadium nitride this is little bit lower the actual value. So, that means AES is not uh, that great analysis as far as the SIMS or XPS is concerned. Second important observation from this is that if you do the bombardment after bombardment and before bombardment there is a change in the nitrogen to metal peak ratio. This is the nitrogen to metal peak ratio I gamma by I alpha. This peak ratio actually decreases after sputtering that is what you see here from 1 uh, from 2 it becomes 1.82, 2.5 to become 2.1, 1.4 to become 1.01, 1.3 become 0.94. That is clear that is because nitrogen actually gets removed during sputtering because it is a light element. So, many times sputtering is bad that is why it is better to do this analysis in the vacuum uh, without any sputtering. Next thing so after giving you an idea of chemical shift chemical detection of chem different elements or different pieces as well as quantification let us go to depth profiling. Auger depth profiling. Well, what is Auger depth profiling actually? As you know, you have this is a sample, suppose, and you have instant electron beam coming into picture, and then it generates Auger electrons, it goes to the electron energy analyzer, and then you get the peaks. Many times, actually, you can routinely get these peaks. Now, we can actually use argon ions to sputter the sample surface sequentially. That means, if I have a sample initially like this, this is taken from this website anyway, then I take information at the beginning from this much area, get the OGS spectra, then using argon ion, I remove small thickness, very small thickness, sputter out of the order of tens of 10 to 20 micro uh, sorry I am strong and then again collect the OGS spectrum that is how I keep on doing it. So, that means slowly 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 I increase the depth or slowly slowly I increase the depth of sputtering and collect the OGS spectrum and if you do that then one can actually do the profiling that means one can actually determine the elements present at each depth and also quantify different elements present. So, this is one plot which is showing here this is sputtering time versus you know intensity as you see here you have a aluminum concentration gold constant decrease aluminum constant increases oxygen constant increases titanium. So, you have chromium titanium gold aluminum oxygen okay. this is basically a gold layer on the top you have aluminum oxide at the bottom and then you have a inter layer between this gold and the aluminum oxide the inter layer consists of chromium and titanium. And that is what you see in the inter this, this concentration of the chromium titanium is very high in the intermediate zone. Gold concentration was high at the beginning that is from 0 to about to, uh, no, 20 minutes you have a large coal concentration then it decreases. And finally, once you reach the aluminum layer aluminum oxide layer you have aluminum and oxygen. So, what does it mean? This is a very important aspect which you must know this is actually required in material science that means that this is a all this very sensitive technique this can be used to even do such a fine scale depth profiling by using argon ion sputtering. Well, it looks very simple and very 
you know genuine and very interesting method, but it has a lot of problems. It can lead to different artifacts. What? It can lead to sample charging because of the you know sputtering. It can lead to topographical feature resulting from non-uniform sputtering of sample. It can lead to even preferential sputtering depends on the element present. Some elements will sputter easily, some elements sputter less easily. Then there are beam effects like argon ion beams and it can also lead to most notably ion beam mixing because you are putting iron argon ions that can lead to mixing of two different elements or two different pieces and that can modify the results. So one must remember these are the problems in OGS depth profiling otherwise this is a very nice technique. Well this is uh, not clear to you visible but uh, just to show you that uh, AFM actually leads to very small thickness on the top surface. OGR is approximately about 100 micron. So OGR, this is OGR, AES. It's about 100 micron depth analysis can be done. Others like XPS can go up to very high. RBS can go up to even my couple of thousands of micro am strong, and FTR things can go up to even micron level, which I will discuss in detail when I compare these different techniques. So uh, to give you much uh, better idea, this is another example, sputtering and non-sputtering, copper and nickel aluminum alloys presents and as you see here copper and nickel alloy actually not aluminum, copper and nickel alloys. As you see here this is the depth profiling of the passivated layer, this is the clean sample. The clean sample is giving much better results, signals than the passivated. Passivated means it might have got oxidized surface layer. So uh, OGS sputtering profiles for the copper nickel alloys is basically uh, taken from mercury at all. It tells us that it is always better to clean the sample surface by sputtering and before taking even the profiles. Another example, this is a gallium nitride substrate with a pre-D inter layer and there is a aluminum layer this is uh, 200 micron, 200 Armstrong PD layer and 1100 mic Armstrong aluminum layer. This is basically a multi-layer as grown. Now one can actually do this you know, schematic profile or profile and genetic profile. This is the aluminum depth, PD depth and gallium nickel. You can see the quality of data one can get, very good quality data one can get using this. This is another example. Uh, I think this is. Uh, PD, germanium, oxygen, aluminium, many things are present. This is part of time versus atomic concentration. This is aluminium, this is oxygen, this is PD, this is gallium, this is nitrogen. One can carefully do that, same sample actually. And then if you annihilate it, it gets changed. I can see that the, the oxygen actually profile has remained same, palladium profile has got changed because palladium has moved into inside the aluminium and on the other hand nickel gallium remains same. So one can actually do this kind of analysis also in the actual sense. The last technique which is useful which I am going to discuss is the scanning OGR electron uh, microscope actually or inland spectroscope. You can actually scan the surface and do that. What you do is basically you can use the same technology as used in the ACM and your beam which is coming and electron which is coming and following the sample surface can be you know allowed to raster on the sample surface or can be allowed to basically scan the sample surface. So as you scan the sample surface you can actually gather information from each point on the sample surface due to interaction of the electron beams with the sample surface and then generate an image instead of depth profiling you can generate actually an image. So details is shown here, what you see here this is scanning coil, uh, this is the electron beam filaments, this is the objective lens, so this is the condensation lens. So if a scanning coil it will scan the beam, scanning coil is nothing but basically same as an electron, uh, scanning electron microscope. Then you have a second electron detector here, this ion detector net here which has sputter, the sample scarusal. So and the actual pike picture is shown here, this is taken from University of Illinois, uh, they have a facility like this. So what is done here, let me describe in a schematic diagram. This is the electron beam falling on the sample surface. So you are basically generating Ke1, Ke3, Ke2 different kinds of uh, 
you know transitions of energies electron of different energies this can be detected because of the presence of different elements actually when you scan and then you can image this image actually is uh, I do not know this is the blue is basically titanium this is taken from this website not from my work. So, they are pictures so, uh, the sulfur is basically the green green is basically for sulfur and red is basically for silicon. As you can see this is the cross section uh, conventional SEM image which does not give much data it is only shows there are different areas uh, sample surface red and the black this has been basically made color. I think this is sulfur uh, backscatter image yeah sulfur backscatter image. So, this is basically sulfur regions. So, as you can see a uh, sulfur is green and uh, in the AES SAM or the scanning or AGS microscopy you can see this red regions are basically coming from silicon these are all silicon ok these three regions silicon 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 and then you have sulfur and the titanium sitting. So, the blue here this much small in is blue and this is uh, this, is, uh, this is green sorry blue here is basically titanium green is basically for sulfur. So, scanning electron microscope shows a large area of sulfur OGA microscope shows there is a thin region of sulfur between silicon and the titanium that is the difference actually one can clearly see when you use scanning OGA microscopy which is much more sensitive than the EDS analysis electron uh, you know energy dispersive spectroscopy analysis in the scanning electron microscope. Well, last thing which I am going to discuss is the OGS setup or how the OGM electron OGR electron spectroscopy is done. Yes. So, as you see here, uh, the schematic diagram here, which is quite complex, this is basically 4 grid LED optics setup uh, which is used to detect data. This is a sample and this is the electron gun. So, electron comes from the gun and from the sample and then you have basically secondary electrons generated OGR electrons generated. So, one needs to detect them and that is why 4 grid LED optics is used. This signal this one is fed to a pre amplifier then there is a phase shifter then there is a lock amplifier and then it goes through different kinds of things finally, you just detect uh, the signal in a computer. These are basically electronics used to modify not to modify to actually improve the signal to noise ratio. And this is the geometry that means basically it is a kind of a hemispherical geometry is used to detect all the other electrons present remember we cannot actually throw out fully the secondary electrons and that remains in the OGS spectroscopy always. So, this cylindrical mirror analyzer is basically use the same thing this is the electron gun uh, so it falls on a sample the sample actually electron gun for samples and this you apply pass energy and uh, then you can actually remove the secondary electrons to that. So, when energy resolution scale up to E p and then you have uh, you have a coaxial design coaxial design like this you can actually eliminate shadowing effect you can have better transmission relative short distance normally lock in interplus get different cell distribution very deeply that is the d n e by d that is what I plot d n e by d versus e is plotted in OGR. So, this is why you need to use lock in amplifiers. You can always use hemispherical analysis that is what I have discussed at the beginning this is the inner hemispherical energy and this is the aperture the sample electron falls and then it falls so it goes through this hemispherical detector and detector. Well, uh, I think that is all rest of the things cannot uh, this will be uh, if I get time we will discuss otherwise next uh, lecture I am going to start the secondary ion mass spectroscopy which is the last surface spectroscopic advanced surface spectroscopy technique in this course and then I am going to compare the uh, these three techniques and wind up this particular portion of the syllabus.